Right. So, good afternoon and welcome. Um, I'm Nancy Law. I'm the correspondent for Condina for the Science of Learning's Strategic Research Team and a member of the Faculty of Education. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all to this set of two lectures on the science of learning and humanities. This event is one of a series of lectures and seminars in the Science of Learning Winter Institute, organized by uh, the strategic research team. The science of learning is an interdisciplinary field that involves the integration of research and knowledge across multiple disciplines to address significant problems in understanding how learning takes place, as well as implementation studies and translation research to develop better strategies and tools to support learning. Learning in humanities provide unique insights into learning in humans uh, as individuals and in different social contexts. And I'm sure tonight's lectures will enlighten us on how interdisciplinary work in the humanities and the science of learning together provide new understanding and in turn enrich the basic disciplines that are involved. So I would now want to introduce our first speaker, Professor Laura Ann Petito, who is now visiting our university as our Sin Wai Kin professor, uh, Distinguished Visiting Professor in the Humanities. Professor Petito is a cognitive neuroscientist. She is the co-principal investigator and science director of the USA's National Science Foundation's Science of Learning Center, Visual Language and Visual Learning, or simply VL2, uh, which is based at Gallaudet University. She is also the scientific director of her own brain and language laboratory for neuroimaging. Professor Petito is known for her role in the creation of the new discipline, um, educational neuroscience, and she's one of the co-founders as well as chair of the steering committee of the PhD in educational neuroscience program at Gallaudet University. This is the first program of its kind to be created in the United States. Um, Professor Petito has won continuous federal and or foundation funding for the past 30 years, and she's a recipient of over 35 international prizes and awards for her scientific achievements and discoveries, including the 1998 Guggenheim Award for her unusually distinguished achievements in the past and exceptional promise for future accomplishment in the neurosciences. In 2009, Professor Petito was appointed a fellow of the American Association of the Advancement of Science and a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science. I think I can go on and on and on and then you won't be able to hear anything if I were to introduce you know, all her achievements. So I think I should stop here and I would like to invite all of you to welcome Professor Petito. I'm extremely grateful to Professor Nancy Law and also to Dean Stephen Andrews. I'm also thankful and grateful to those of you in the humanities and the Faculty of Education for making possible the Sin Wai Kin Distinguished Visiting Professorship. Uh, and thank you so much. Um, I've been very interested in this particular award. I was uh, uh, I very much admired the statement uh, that uh, Dr. Sin Wai Kin has uh, said, he said, I believe the humanities can enrich and illuminate our lives, literature, music, history, philosophy, law, politics, social sciences, architecture, and the arts are all important. I couldn't agree with that more. I also was very excited by the humanities webpage definition of what we do. Uh, what we do is then that the School of the Humanities is devoted to critical and creative thought through the study of what makes us uniquely human. The way we think and communicate, the objects we make and enjoy, our investment in events and institutions, our cultural practices and social values, all these things constitute the subject of our teaching and research. And what fascinates me is that's how I would describe what I do. Yet we have very much silos and thoughts of the separation of the neurosciences and the humanities. So to help us kind of relax and get into the evening, because it's very, I know it's after a long day of work, it's a nice of you to come, um, I'm going to show, it's a, a, a quick video clip, it's one minute, 36 seconds, 
And I want you to think about how you would classify this. Would you classify this as a, an, an instance of a topic in the humanities or an instance in the topic of neurosciences, the neurosciences? So let's begin. Sit back. It's a minute and 36 seconds. And um, here we go.
fall under the general rubric of the science of learning. Now, the science of learning is comprised of a large interdisciplinary group of scientists. Uh, Professor Law gave a beautiful definition of the science of learning and its uh, mission and objectives. The science of learning are made up of multidisciplinary teams that study learning across the lifespan. So why is there this other field called educational neuroscience? They're actually intimately related. In one way, you can look at them as one and the same thing. Educational neuroscience, a, a subset of the multidisciplinary studies of learning, but here it's learning across early life. In particular, they, there's um, a commitment to looking at the core types of knowledge that make up the developing child. Neuroimaging and behavioral methods are used. And importantly, it's not just brain studies. It's brain studies in intimate and important combination with the behavioral sciences and behavioral studies. So the different areas that make up educational neuroscience, or the focus of the science of learning on a developing child, have to do with learning at the heart of child, adolescent, and young adults. Important here is a commitment to translating this knowledge to address core areas, core problems in education. It doesn't mean that the educational neuroscience or the cognitive neuroscientist is actually going to go out and do the translation, but that the knowledge of these important questions and the relationship between the scientific findings and the types of problems they resolve will be made available and accessible to the public. And I'll give you some ideas of that today. And just to give you a sense of the five core topics, imagine science of learning, having a child at the center of a five-point star. It involves studies of language and bilingualism. It involves studies of math and numeracy, science and critical thinking, social, emotional, moral development, and reading and literacy. So these are the type of domains that fall under the science of learning, and particular scientists who do educational neuroscience. As I mentioned in a talk given a few days ago, there's been quite a spectacular worldwide interest in the science of learning and the educational neuroscience. It's actually 14 years old. This is not so young by the birth of new disciplines. Oops. Um, uh, there are educational neuroscience programs at Stanford University, Vanderbilt University, Harvard University, Johns Hopkins, Gallaudet University. Gallaudet is the first PhD program in educational neuroscience. Some of these have master's programs. Cambridge University, University College London, Birkbeck College. There's also serious interest at East China uh, Normal in Shanghai, Shanghai University. And there's the NSF office in Beijing, which is uh, receiving enthusiastic interest in um, uh, beginning neuro educational neuroscience programs. Funding has increased around the world, interest from the OECD and the United Nations, and finally this international attention that really has begun to focus on the fruits, what these disciplines can give rise to, and the types of solutions that they can offer to contemporary education. So the main talk, the main point, I would like to give the main point of my uh, presentation uh, pretty much at the beginning so you can help follow along with me in arriving at that main point. I'd like to suggest today that neuroscience and the humanities are actually not that far apart, that we need to break down these silos and need to begin really building unified and uh, strong unions because um, the neurosciences are infused with the humanities, that ultimately we seek to answer common questions, and that mutual two-way exchange between the humanities and the neurosciences will yield exciting new knowledge, uh, revolutionize our understanding of what it means and what, it, what makes us uniquely human. So to begin, um, I'd like to, uh, as a walking tour of my, my own uh, uh, career that spans four decades. I have done work in the language learning brain. I have done work in the reading brain, in the dancer's brain, in the bilingual's brain, in the chimpanzee's brain, and in the silent brain. 
So of course I can't talk to you about all that today. Instead, I'll talk to you about two of these areas, the dancer's brain, more accurately, the performing artist's brain, and the silent brain. Okay, so to begin, I will turn to the brain of the performing artist. Now this work began as a result of a science of learning center. In 2004, at Dartmouth College, we uh, won one of the National Science Foundation Science of Learning Center grants. This was, we were the first cohort of um, four in the United States. Our center was called the Center for Cognitive and Educational Neuroscience. And we began very quickly to begin making discoveries in which we saw that aspects of training in one area in higher cognition actually impacted positively knowledge and training and learning in another area. So we were interested in that. And given the commitment of educational neuroscience and the neuroscience <coughs> sciences in general, we began to realize that around us, arts education in schools were the first to be cut. I don't know if you have this problem here in um, Hong Kong, but in the United States when, and in Canada, when there's a budget crisis in a local school district, the first thing that's suggested to be cut is to cut the arts out. So we were interested in whether, in the following question, so first I'll just say we built a team, uh, we wrote a grant to the Data Foundation in the United States, uh, it was written by Kevin Dunbar and myself. Uh, we built a team with Michael Gazanica and um, uh, among the top brain images uh, in the United States. And we asked the following question. Does learning in the arts provide any other cognitive, higher cognitive benefits? So most of us know or have thoughts about this and opinions that are strongly of anecdotal base. And some of us have heard of the Mozart effect. So we first then looked at what is available to, what is available out in the public on this topic. And there wasn't a lot. First, as I said, there's lots of anecdotal evidence. I mean, parents feel really profoundly committed that their child should be educated in the arts. But there wasn't any solid evidence to present to educational system. And given the commitment to bridge neuroscience with education, we needed evidence. What was available was bad science, science that um, made herald the Mozart effect. And this was um, not uh, done. Uh, there were lots of problems with this research. In particular, the uh, subjects had to listen to a piece of Mozart and then perform what was called an intelligent test. And it turned out it was a paper folding test. And there were, this was, uh, was very hard to replicate. And when this was studied in depth, it turns out that the impact of listening to Mozart is just very slight attentional arousal, that it quickly dissipates. So this wasn't counted as hardcore evidence for school systems or evidence-based research to change educational policy. So as background to the types of studies that these different teams began, we had um, our first purpose of the grant was to understand, was there any impact on the child in learning of the arts? Was there any transfer of the knowledge and the intensity with which children are uh, trained in the arts and their ability to learn math or reading or other subjects? Uh, there were three complementary strands of research within the overall grant that had to do with studies of the similarities and differences of individual brains exposed to the performing arts versus people who had no exposure to the performing arts versus individuals who had intensive training that equaled the amount of time that someone would be trained in the arts, but it wasn't arts. It might have been intensive physical activity, intensive sports. So it was motor activity that was intensively focused and the same number of hours as an artist might practice, but um, it wasn't the arts. We also looked at uh, the uh, subjects were, again, these are several labs across the nation, uh, each focusing on a different part of the performing arts, attention, working memory, language, reading, and um, var various other tasks. These were tasks that were standardized across the labs. We all, in, a, in the individual arts that we studied, gave individual similar tasks 
to understand whether or not there were uh, an impact of the training in the arts. The studies of, uh, we looked at uh, children and adults and higher cognitive abilities. Again, we're particularly interested in whether or not intensive training in the arts gives benefits to other areas and why that might be if it existed. And we're also interested in, ex in um, exploring new ways with neuroimaging to uh, study the young developing child and uh, study the arts. So the arts we in, that were involved in the different labs, uh, each lab took a different art. Uh, there were um, those of us who studied dance, uh, those of us who studied music, and those of us who studied theater. I actually did dance and theater. Um, in the predictions were generally that there would be no impact. Students can study in the art, and then if assessed on other cognitive, higher cognitive tasks like math or aspects of analytical reasoning, critical reasoning, we should see no impact at all. They're somewhat autonomous. Training in the arts doesn't facilitate training in other higher cognitive areas or learning. So then we predicted none. Another thing that might happen is it might be local facilitation. Local meaning, for example, if you were a pianist, we might see enhanced motor, fine motor coordination in the motor cortex. But that wouldn't be translated into higher cognitive frontal lobe enhancements and the functions that follow from frontal lobe enhancements. <coughs> and then another, we looked at what was called long distance impact. Would the impact of training in the arts have any impact, show us anything with regard to spanning to other cognitive domains? All right, so very briefly, uh, what we found is that there was a very strong impact of intensive training in the arts. The, a, a children who had, uh, and, and this was um, involved uh, more than uh, 14 hours of study a day, they had to have performed at least three times, and they had to have uh, at least 10 years of training. So we um, very carefully dif differentiated novices from experts and the types of criteria that would follow from them. Very carefully controlled study. I'm just giving you the punchline of this uh, late hour with much to cover. I'm not going to take you through every single lab's individual conditions and experiments, but just um, as a group, uh, there was overwhelmingly strong impact that advantages, there were advantages to working memory, there were advantages to language, there were advantages to reading processes and, and, and uh, advancements in the children's reading who had intensive training in the arts compared to children who had not that intensive training in the arts. What was interesting is that in the performing arts, again, did transfer to other content areas. So it wasn't just that if you were a pianist, you were better at fine motor tasks. If you were a pianist, you were better at mathematical processing and aspects of, of reasoning and reading. Se sequential, uh, se uh, complex syntactic decomposition, if you were an expert in um, uh, pi uh, piano and uh, expert in dance movements. Um, so the complex performing arts stimulated higher cognitive functions that gave rise to other advantages, and we actually saw very specific patterns of brain changes in people who were exposed to the arts uh, versus not in ways that we could predict whether or not they would have the concomitant higher cognitive advantage. So to conclude on those series of studies, the arts education fostered generalizable skills, an advantage to generalize the other higher cognitive skills. Student, it helped students in many areas who were non-artists when they did receive uh, the training. The skills were not just perceptual or motor, but involved higher cognitive reasoning, as I said, mathematical reasoning, aspects of complex syntax, um, uh, and uh, language processing. And as an aside, if you made the choice of providing your children with uh, intensive training in the arts, you're actually helping their brain. So uh, if parents, um, uh, th these studies have been published. 
Uh, there was a book that followed from this, there were articles that followed from this, and um, there's a, a monograph on my own web page that you can download to, see, to download to see each individual study and each individual study's findings. So briefly turning to the silent brain, uh, I wanted to uh, talk to you about the different types of insights that we can get in the humanities from the study of silent languages and in the neurosciences as well. So what are these silent languages? Uh, these are naturally evolved languages. Let's, um, uh, let me talk a few minutes about the, the common myths about them. Uh, sign languages are naturally evolved. Um, they are uh, tens of thousands of years old. There's uh, um, serious uh, evidence that um, they have co-evolved with uh, the evolution of speech. Um, they are not universal, so the sign language in different countries are not the signed counterpart of that languages of that country's spoken language. One example to bring this example home is um, in the United States and in the United Kingdom, the majority language is spoken English. But the deaf people in those two countries do not understand each other. They would need an interpreter to communicate. So the structure of British Sign Language is grammatically distinct and autonomous from the structure of American Sign Language that's used in the United States. And that's a nice example because the basic structure of the two spoken languages are similar, but the sign languages are not the signed counterpart of the majority spoken language. Sign languages are not made up of unsystematic gestures. They're not even made up of holistic gestures. One of the most thrilling things in my own career is to discover that they're made up of a restricted set of units from which all the signs and sentences in the language are built in the same way that in spoken language we have a restricted set of sound units from which we build all the words and sentences in our language. And let me take that back a minute and just um, try to communicate the power of that convergence of structure across the modalities. We, for eons, the uh, scientists, linguists have looked at the structure of what comes out of the human mouth on the promise that we're getting some deep insight into the structure of language in the human brain and knowledge about language and knowledge about language meaning. Well, what happens is aspects of language are changed as they get altered and rush from the motor cortex onto the lips and out. What happens if here we are looking at the product of the human mouth, assuming that we're seeing something deep and central about language and deep and central about language in the brain, but what happens if the structure of human language is an accidental consequence of the modality of that well, one way to test that is to look at language on the hands. It's not involving speech perception. It's not involving speech production. Here, we strip the brain of sound, and instead we give it the hands, and we see how the brain imposes a structure onto the hands. And if we compare the structure of the language that comes from the mouth and the structure of the language that comes from the hands, the commonalities across the two modalities can be said to really reflect the deep central properties of human language that all language must assume, the essential properties of human language. Whereas those properties that change based on whether it comes out of the mouth or whether it comes out of the hands are due to local modality effects. So for example, we speak in spoken language we, can only, we have one mouth, we can only say one word at a time, and so the structure of syntax in all world languages is fundamentally sequential. You could only say one word at a time. So if we take the brain and we strip it of speech, the structure of sign language syntax is simultaneous because the visual perception systems permit simultaneous perception in the visual array. So rather than having, for example, in English, I am walking by putting ing at the end of walk to indicate I'm in the process of doing it, in American Sign Language, you would take the sign and you would situate it in an elliptical, an elliptical path in the front 
front of your body. And that would be the ING, and it's produced simultaneous with the sign. So this is I am walking. I take the sign one, I put it in that elliptical pathway, and I am running. If I put the sign look in that pathway, I've just said I am looking. And what's important is that there are modality differences based on perceptual degrees of freedom. But what's core and get, what gets pushed out onto the mouth and pushed out onto the tongue is the fact that human language expresses the passage of time and does it in systematic and regular ways. And so both of these languages have the systematicity, the morphology, the, sy the syntactic rules that cannot be violated. So these languages have been very exciting to lay bare what's the essential parts of human language that are part of the species and tease apart what are the superficial parts of human language that are just the result of the modality. So these languages are not universal. They're not built of gestures. Another way to show that is the human mouth has the capacity to make many sounds. What's fascinating is that all world languages don't take that biological capacity. The human language, and human language on this planet only selects a finite set of phonetic units from which all the words and all the sounds in human language will be built. So there's an example of where the human brain turns away from a biological capacity and the linguistic systems of our species are really formed from a highly restricted set. It's a fascinating uh, paradoxical nature of language. It's built from a finite set of units and from finite, finite set of units we make the infinite expressive capacity of natural language. And it's been one of the things that, that um, uh, paradoxical nature of language has been a fascination for linguists for decades. But one of the things that's very interesting is that you might say, well, where does that constraint come from? Maybe there are so many languages used from 23 to 76 distinctions. World average is around 40 distinctions of, of sounds. Why, where did that come from? Well, for decades, the hypothesis is that that came from constraints of the human mouth. That that's all we can make with the mouth. That's the number of degrees of freedom that the tongue going forward, up, back, down, and back would make. That that's the number of sounds we make because that's the constraint of the oral facial cavity. Well, there's an example of where sign languages can revolutionize our understanding about the essential properties of human language. This is a language that's not constrained by sound. It's not constrained by mouth. Strip away the tongue. What do we see on the hands? All world sign languages are formed from a highly restricted set of about 45 hand primes. That's an extraordinary convergence of structure across the mouth and across the tongue onto an essential phonological cap inventory from which the entire languages of all the sign languages in the world are constructed. And they differ just the way spoken languages differ. So French has very much the uh, similar phonological inventory as English, except there are units that are not in English, like a nasalized N. But there's a large degree, if it was a Venn diagram, there's a large degree of overlap. But what makes French French and English English is that the rules by which we apply to that inventory of sounds and the rules by which we apply to English and French, those are what distinguish the ways in which the two languages are ultimately different. And of course, with meaning and reference and cultural significance. Sign languages accomplish the same thing with this restricted set of units. The sign language in Long Sing Quebecois used in, in Quebec, by the way, is different from uh, the French sign language used in France. Those two languages have the overlapping set of phonetic inventory, the phonemes on the hands, and those, but there are some ways in which the, the actual units are in one we say marked or unusual and uh, rare in one language and common in the other. And what differs between Long Sin and, and the 
favorite sign language used in France are the rules that you apply to each of the languages that give rise to completely different languages and cultural groups, etc. So these are not made up of gestures. Sign languages are made up of phonetic units, of morphological units, of syntactic units. Again, if you don't study this and you're just hearing this for the first time, do you think this is, isn't this amazing? I mean, I thought this was amazing when I first, it's, it's remarkable. We have these assumptions and they're not true. And one of the ways we found out they're not true is by joining humanities and linguistics and brain sciences together to bring to bear a common set of goals to understand how these languages are made up. Do they have cultural norms? Do they have normal development, etc.? Another thing I should make sure I mention is that these languages are not invented. I think I said that. They're thousands of years old. It's from our earliest evidence. They're as old as spoken languages. And they're not iconic. They're not little pictures in the head. So for example, when a deaf person is uh, having a conversation, just like we will, they make slips of the hand, from which the phonetic unit that they draw is not from a gestural uh, set, but only the, the slip of the hand, just like the slip of the tongue, only is drawn from the highly restricted, restricted with phonetic units of that native language. There are also, um, if you do memory studies, uh, there are signs, for example, that are semantically related. So the, sam the sign for tree uh, might be, con um, so the sign for, let's say tree and bird are semantically related. So in a memory drum, if I gave you a list of uh, signs, you may confuse or misremember or cluster signs that are semantically related. Instead, that's not what's found in the psycholinguistic studies. Deaf people make the same kind of componential errors that we make in spoken language. So rather than confusing tree with bird, because they're semantically related, deaf people show us that they're doing internal componential phonological analyses of the forms by virtue of their mistakes. A deaf person is much more likely to confuse bird and newspaper because the phonological unit is preserved, used differently according to the rules of the production of the language. One means bird, one means newspaper, but the phonological similarity is what confuses them and trips them up. In the same way, um, we can uh, do that to hearing people by putting in foils that are phonologically uh, for the step of that and confusing the perceiver. So very briefly, some of you who were in my talk the other day know that there's some biological data that we have that raise the suspicion that these languages were not only equivalent from the level of linguistic structure, they were not only equivalent from the level of cultural groups, but they were, they were also biologically equivalent. And let me just step back one moment. We know that from early studies of Ursula Belugi and the studies of linguists from the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there's an extraordinary amount of evidence, as you know as a linguist, that sign languages are real languages. In parallel, as these linguists were doing their research, cultural anthropologists and uh, members of the humanities came together and were identifying that sign languages cohered groups of people that formed distinct cultures. But when it came to the 80s and 90s and the 2000s, people still would sit back and say, well, that's true, sign languages are real languages, and sign languages isn't that sweet, they have their own culture. However, it's not equal. Speech is better. So we set out to test the hypothesis. Is speech biologically superior? And just to review uh, 40 years of research in three slides and what you already saw, what we found out is they're biologically equivalent. So you have like a trilogy. You have sign languages are real languages, sign languages are from the humanities of distinct cultures, and then the missing piece was biology. And how would you test that? Well, one thing we looked at is that we found that they're acquired on the same maturational timetable. 
a child exposed to sign language and a child exposed to speech each achieves each and every milestone in human language acquisition on the identical timetable. Well, this is extraordinary. You can't have a model that says human language is acquired because it's reflecting the maturation of the orofacial region and the maturation of the capacity to hear and receive sounds and that the milestones we see are just the external indices of the brain maturation of soaring up the motor strip with the uh, oral facial region and the capacity to map word meanings onto the production of language. Because when you test that, a test of that biological hypothesis is to take a child to script of speech who's only getting language on the hands. They don't have a maturation of the mouth. They don't have a maturation of the ears. So the prediction is, is that their acquisition should be radically different. And what we see is, no, there's a stunning convergence across the maturation of children exposed to sign language and children exposed to speech. So whatever is in the human brain that's driving human language acquisition, we can't, a, a, an unsatisfactory explanation is to put all our eggs in the basket of speech. Because whatever is driving human language acquisition is so powerful that it can perceive structural invariances across the hand and across the tongue, and the child is going to hit the hips every milestone on the same time table. Very briefly, another biological piece of evidence is that holding aside the overall timetable, the individual structures are the same. So children exposed to sign language, babble on their hands, are the same maturational timetable as children who exposed to spoken language, babble on their mouth. And the structural unit is the same. Rhythmic undulating bursts and consonant vowel, consonant vowel bursts of about a quarter of oh, in the half. Then when we look at the human Too brain, long. what do we see? We find that the neural tissue that we thought for 125 years was uniquely dedicated, neural tissue uniquely dedicated to the processing of auditory information, what do we find? Instead, that tissue is not dedicated to auditory, in, uh, in, uh, auditory processing, but that it's dedicated to highly specific the detection of patterning, rhythmic undulating patterning, and maximal contrast in the input that is of around a hertz, a hertz and a half. So this is, this is neuroanatom this neuroanatomical dogma for 125 years that the planum temporality and the superior temporal gyrus is the exclusive unimodal process cycle of processing of sound, and we have no evidence for that. Instead, what we have is that the um, primary and auditory cortex in deaf and hearing brains would remain in, uh, entirely equivalent, equivalent gray and white matter if they had early exposure to, spoken, uh, to sign language. So, what this lets us conclude is that specific patterns in human language are key, not sound. It's very <coughs> exciting. This is a new view. Um, if you didn't, if this is the first time you're hearing of this tonight, it's not the case that speech and language are one and the same. This is research that rips apart speech and language, challenges our perception. This, cha this is taking, giving us a new cultural meme. It's a new idea. It's, it shakes us up. We thought speech was special. It's not speech that's special, but it's the patterns that get pressed into human language that's special, and that the brain has evolved tissue to detect. And the brain will take the hands if you give it the hands. It'll take the tongue if you give it the tongue. It could care less. It just wants experience with the patterns. And so, um, very specifically, the patterns are um, temporal rhythmic undulating patterns that are at the heart of human language phonology. This is the result of, um, as I said, four decades of work. Um, uh, and so the punchline for the humanities and for the sciences is that these languages acquire entirely normal ways. And I'll take you uh, beyond that. I'm going to show you a very sweet clip, a clip of two uh, young deaf boys. They're in the back of the car. They're signing, uh, they're deaf, they're signing American Sign Language. Um, uh, I hope you can read quickly the captions. These children are, um, it's extraordinary rich language. Those of you who do language acquisition will know that they have morphology, they have syntax, complex, look at the complex 
semantic questions they're asking. These are very young children. And uh, this is in, uh, they're actually um, a little bit on the upward scale of uh, normal human language acquisition. I wouldn't quite call these kids normal. We'd actually put them on, you know, gifted uh, if they were hearing children and they were just uh, uh, speaking uh, um, in spoken language. And, okay, so I'll be quiet and you can just look at this. Oh, the caption's not there. Okay. Uh, it's very complex morphological unit. He just said that there's a, a car vehicle classifier morphological is on the lift. The bait. Oh, sorry. It's very hard to... Uh, uh, I'll just let you watch it. And I won't put it into English. They're communicating with each other. <laughs> to my um, Also, uh, a point is uh, how this is captioned. This is ASL. She, um, she's signing ASL, not Cantonese. There is Cantonese sign language. There's Mandarin sign language. Uh, I had, uh, this is a sign for Hong Kong uh, in ASL. Um, uh, this has particular meaning for me because um, one of my deaf students ended this, this uh, last year and won in the short film competition. So, um, uh, but the, what you see here is discoveries that were made possible by the coming together of the humanities and the neurosciences. Linguists, cultural anthropologists, and biological scientists together working to crack the code for the nature of these languages and the people who use them. So I um, uh, just thought I would spend just a few more minutes on what visual phonology uh, what that discovery uh, looks look like looks like, and what its uh, what its educational neuroscience implications were. So these are incredible discoveries. Um, they're uh, 40 years into the knowledge that we have, but they have, in the spirit of the science of learning and in the spirit of educational neuroscience, we now are ready to take these discoveries and bridge them into meaningful application. So, uh, the first thing um, uh, that, uh, what, what is it that visual sign phonology might look like and how might we use this information in the education of young children? So, one thing we know is that when a hearing child, a young, young child is learning to read, they take the segments 
um, the sounds that they hear in words. And one of the things they do is attempt to map the sounds and the words that they hear to the letters on the page. And you may think, oh, well, that's just alphabetic languages. That's only relevant to a hearing child learning to read in English. And this is not true. There's lovely research, Terry out here at the University of Hong Kong and others have shown that young Chinese children in the early stages into decoding the logogram actually also attempt to take the, to look for and map phonetic units from speaking Chinese and try to map it to segmentally to parts of the, the uh, Chinese character. So it seems that a very young child from ages two to three has a peak sensitivity to phonological contrasts and in learning early reading attempt to map the sounds that they hear in the constant stream, harness them in chunks and map them, they attempt to map them onto parts of the characters. And in uh, alphabetic languages, they attempt to map them onto the letters on the page, the graphemes that we see before them. And more than that, 30 years of research from alphabetic languages has claimed that a child's success at reading obligatorily requires that mapping. So if you're going to learn to read, you have to hear. You must hear. How can you learn to, to decode the letters on the page if you don't have access to sound? So the dogma is that young deaf children are doomed. They'll never learn to read well because they can't hear. So they'll always be remediated. They'll always have problems reading. Well, I think if you came to Gallaudet University or other universities or Harvard, you'd be stunned. There are profoundly deaf students and they're brilliant readers. So the question is, how do they learn to read? They don't hear. And we have a wonderful insight in the same way that oh, so the multiple cues, the, uh, a young hearing child looks at rhythmic temporal aspects, phonetic phonetic <coughs> unit, orthographic patterns, and so the deaf child how does it do it? Successful children, successful readers in sign language are successful because they had early exposure to sign languages in the right critical period of development when the uh, superior temporal gyrus and the plenum temporale are in peaked development. And in that period, during the critical period, when they had exposure to sign languages, their brain was sensitive to the rhythmic undulating patterns, extracted them out, and set up a visual sign phonology that is literally homologous with auditory sound phonology. So phonology is an abstract level. So it's actually the linguist were right. It's an abstract level of language organization. But what's innovative and new is that it's not dependent on sound. It really is an abstract level that the brain sets up. And the neural tissue is so powerful that it'll take a morsel of sound if you get sound, and it'll take a morsel of the hands if you give the brain the hands. And it will take the visual stream and chunk it and segment and pull out the unit from the infinite, continuously rich, densely packed signal. It's a machine that allows the child to chunk a continuous visual information and to chunk continuous auditory information. Again, the tissue is sensitive to rhythmic undulating patterns, not to sound. And that sensitivity allows the child to find the word in a constantly varying, densely packed, hierarchical organized linguistic signal. So if you say to a child, there's the ball, that's a ball, the child has to be able to hear ball in order to solve the problem of reference, and this is the brain tissue that allows the child to find it, and it will do it if it gets the hands, and it'll do it if it gets the tongue. Deaf children form a visual sign phonology. It's remarkable. So profoundly deaf people who are outstanding readers are reading because they're looking at the letters on the page, and those letters in the page are being turned into phonological units in sign language in the same way a hearing person looks at the phonological at the letters on the page and turns it into phonological units in their mind. It's identical. So based on this, let me give you another way to see this. Um, 
Uh, you have rhythmic undulations that the brain is sensitive to in the superior temporal gyrus, particularly in the plantum temporality, and it peaks, it comes online in utero at five months gestation, it peaks at age three, it wanes at age seven, and by nine years old it's stabilized. Here, it's so, this is tissue that's sensitive to rhythmic undulating patterns, whatever, so it chunks a continuous visual stream, it chunks a continuous auditory stream, whatever units fall under that, the child is then able to extract out, and in extracting out, they, that's how they can find the, phonetically, the phonetic inventory, and then that's how they can then begin to solve the problem of meaning or reference. With this information, we were able to then have powerful translational impact. We are building e-literacy in which we have sign language and um, uh, stories in sign language that give the child accentuated phonology. And then, there, I, I don't have the whole sequence here, but what we have is then uh, letters and words come up that match the child's, that match the phonology that's in the woman's signing with aspects of the phonology of English on the page. These are bilingual ASL English texts. Uh, other research that we did is to look at the brain's uh, the tissue and how it develops for the phonology and how reading occurs during the phonology. Once we uh, found the tissue and the temporal hertz, we then artificially created this with MoCap lab. I'll just show you this. This is done in Remy Brun's lab in Paris. We're uh, attempting, this is a nursery rhyme in sign language. We're attempting to get the rhythmic nucleus. This is a nursery rhyme in sign language in ASL. It's artificially generated in mocap. <coughs> we then played that rhythmic temporality to young hearing and deaf children. Hearing children who had never been exposed to sign language. And we found that all children respond to the rhythmicity that you're seeing in this patterning. Some of the innovative translation we're doing goes beyond this. We're working with David Trom at San Diego, uh, University of California, San Diego. And what we do is he's working with avatars to build an avatar robotic crib toy that engages the baby in an interactive, socially interactive, contingent way. Then the avatar comes up and gives the baby nursery rhymes so they get the rhythmic undulating pattern within the right developmental period. I'll just show you, uh, this is, a, we're working with uh, David Trom in California and Brian Scazzolati at Yale, here's his keypon. Just show you. give nursery rhymes in the right temporal unit, and also uh, we have a thermal infrared imaging system that's built into it that only responds when the baby's in peak attentional and arousal state because human language acquisition obligatorily requires social contingency. You can have, put your baby in front of a TV or you like it, it won't learn another language. You need social interaction, that is species specific. Chimpanzees don't need this, only we need this. And so, um, what I've tried to tell you, my main point is that uh, by coming together, the neurosciences and the humanities, um, uh, the neurosciences are infused with the humanities, one cannot live without the other. 
Ultimately, we all seek to answer a similar question, especially if the question entails what makes us unique, uniquely human. And if we come together and pull down these silos, we will have mutual two-way explosive new knowledge. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. This is a fascinating, fascinating um, talk. And she was so attracted. You know, for us, we look at Teletubby, it's so dumb. <laughs> but, but the way she responded to Teletubby is very different from the other. So, so that's fascinating. Um, well, we don't have too much time, but I can say a couple of questions. So any, any comments, questions? Well, I really do agree that the was very fascinating. And uh, I have just a question about the uh, um, reading part. So like for English words, when we read, we usually decode the graphing and decode the into sounds and then we decode them and then we read them. So I'm just wondering for deaf people, when they read English words, do they have a direct like graphing, phoneme correspondence to the sign language? Or do you agree that it's actually like reading sign languages and reading um, text is like bilingualism to them. Perhaps could you sort of briefly introduce yourself in one sentence? Oh, um, I'm Ricky and I'm from the Department of Psychology. I'm doing a PhD in Educational Psychology. Oh, nice to meet you. Um, uh, oh, I just want to make sure I understand. So you're asking about the reading process uh, and whether or not there is a direct mapping from or, or is there some other roof that they're accessing? Like the, um, the letters of um, the languages in the alphabet. Because I'm not really familiar with the alphabet. So I'm wondering whether the letters of the English alphabet can be read. Do they map directly into um, the sign languages? Or, or do you agree that it's actually like bilingual to the Greek text? It's a really astute, great question. Um, there's no question that these children are becoming bilingual. But to answer your question from a biological, what we know biologically, there, um, there are multiple cues that they're accessing that give rise to specific patterning. So they're not, they are direct, in some cases, they're directly accessing the letter to the syllabic unit that that's represented. In other cases, they get it's multiple cues. Just like a hearing child will get information from the visual grapheme and its patterns, a deaf child gets information from visual grapheme and its patterns. So they're pulling together multiple cues. Another way in which a deaf child is getting one-to-one uh, -one mapping is through finger spelling that is, uh, is the only interface between a natural sign language and a spoken language. That just finger spelling is an invented bridge. But it's not an intimate, it's not a part of a natural sign language. But in educational context, it's used to facilitate a child's mapping between the letter and the sign language. So these multiple cues are coming online. But to answer your question, yes, there is direct mapping in, for aspects of their decoding between the letter and the syllabic unit in sign language. They're not, it's not, med, it doesn't need to be mediated by spoken language. It doesn't, they don't have to go to sound to learn to read. They have to go to phonology, to the phonological level of language organization to learn to read. That we can't do without. The human brain wants it so much, it makes it. it from morsels of the, of the input, it imposes it, that regularity and that systematicity and that level of analysis on the input. One more question. Thank you very much for a very exciting and interesting talk. Um, I wanted to ask a question because I'm interested, uh, my area of research is first language acquisition in music. 
So, in a way, this from your talk, it sounds like well, music's pretty insignificant in a way. And I know Stephen Pinker described it as auditory cheesecake. So, I, I, I've always thought, or sort of my hypothesis, that music facilitates language learning, especially at these critical ages. So, can you comment about that, and if it's playing a role, and maybe could you comment about the evolution of language, and if. Uh, uh, why do we have music if it's not necessary to have sound? Um, uh, music is a creative po uh, putting together of units in um, patterns and uh, <coughs> it's part of the human brain's uh, unique and species specific uh, capacity to create. Um, uh, but let me step back. Um, I'm so sorry if I uh, suggested that music wasn't important. Um, I, I, I was trying to say that um, uh, patterned activity, dance, creative and patterned activity, dance and music and theater uh, actually contributed to a child's facilitation and advantaged a child's higher cognitive processing. So music. Uh, plays a very important role, can play a very important role in facilitating children's mathematical capacities, um, sequential and serial ordering detection. Um, uh, so music is, uh, affords benefits to a young developing child. Um, now, um, uh, so I wouldn't believe at all, I wouldn't suggest at all that it's auditory cheesecake. Um, uh, what my research emphasizes is that it's not the sound part of language or the sound part of music that's key, but the brain sensitivity to highly specific sequences and neural tissue that's dedicated to finding the sequences in the input. And we will find it in auditory information like music and we will find it in systematic patent information like moving hands. The brain is not restricted to a modality. It has peak sensitivity and developmental maturation on a maturational timetable, and it's sensitive to specific units, and they change over time. The envelope, the sensitivity changes over the first life, first year of life, and the child can embrace patterns that come in musically, patterns that come in uh, through spoken language and patterns that come in through the hands. And um, if I may just give you one quick example, this tissue is so powerful that it really does, in, in the right developmental time, take any morsel. So um, in the, uh, there was a box that, for deaf-blind people who don't have direct access to spoken language or vision, um, Carol Chomsky actually uh, it worked with um, uh, engineers at MIT and they built the Todoma box, which is, takes uh, speaking and puts pinpricks on the stomach of a deaf-blind person. This brain tissue is so powerful that in something as abstract and removed from the primary signal, like speaking, it, takes, it sends pinpricks on the person's stomach like a speech spectrogram and from pinpricks on the stomach, the deaf-blind person built a phonological level of language representation. So that's how impoverished the signal can be and how many degrees of freedom of abstraction it can be from the primary single speech. How far can I get pinpricks on my stomach to setting up a phonological representation? That's very far. And yet that's how powerful the tissue is that's looking for the temporal sequencing uh, in the input. So I never would say that music is not important or... Thank you. I'm sure we have a lot more questions. The good news is um, Professor Petito will, will not be leaving us, um, you know, well, she will be leaving us for this visit at the end of the month, but she will be coming back, you know, for several more visits over longer periods of time. So, um, so there are opportunities to um, to talk to her and 
and in fact, if you're interested to um, connect with Professor Petito, you could send an email to the SLT. So, S O L hyphen S L T. I'm oh, no, sorry. S O L S L T at Hong Kong dot Hong Kong or H K U dot H K. Then we would be um, able to sort of process and connect you with Professor Petito. So, first of all, can may I invite all of you to join me in thanking Professor Petito?